welcome all of you to our worship service this evening, especially any uh, guests we have with us tonight. This is Ash Wednesday, the first day in the church season of Lent. For our devotion tonight, we will learn exactly what it means to observe Lent. We begin with our first hymn, hymn 111, Sweet the Moments, Rich in Blessing. service as it's printed in the service bulletin or up on the screen. O oh Lord, open my lips. Hasten to save me, O oh Lord. The Lord be with you. Lord God, you have brought us safely to this hour of evening prayer. We thank you for providing all that we need for body and life. Bless us who have gathered in your name. Forgive our sins. Speak to our hearts. Dispel our sorrows with the comfort of your word. And receive our hymns of thanks and praise through Jesus Christ, our living Savior, who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. in time of need, that we may sing your praise in holy joy now and forever through Jesus Christ our Lord.
Please be seated. As is printed in the in the service folder, this this imposition of ashes thing is completely adiaphora, completely uh, it's not commanded nor forbidden in Scripture. So um, it's something that that I personally I had never done un, until here just a few years ago, and we started doing it here, and, and uh, just so much symbolism in church that oh, am I waiting? Am I interrupting the choir? Oh, no, you're getting ready to sing during this. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> that, that, that symbolism, so much symbolism throughout, throughout a church, and, and there's a symbolism here, too, of, of this imposition of ashes that, that there certainly is a connection with uh, a sim symbolic of, of ashes to ashes. God made Adam mankind from dust, and we return to dust, the, the dirt, the mud reality, but then also um, the cross part. Right? The symbolism behind the cross of our Savior suffering and death. So, um, the imposition of ashes, uh, our ushers here are going to go basically like we do for uh, communion, starting in the back. And if you want to come up, we're basically going to divide uh, the west half of the middle here, come down here, and, and come to Pastor Linky, and then go back around the outside. So, we're come up down the middle, back around the outside. And, and same thing for here, that uh, if you don't want to, don't. That's, that's just fine. Nobody's going to think any, any less. And if you don't want it on your noggin, uh, just, just hold out your hand and, and we'll, we'll put it on your hand instead. So, um, part of our Ash Wednesday service, the imposition of ashes.
continue our worship by singing Psalm 51a, Psalm 51a. us your Holy Spirit that we may hear and believe your word. Cleanse our minds and renew our hearts that we may live for you here and hereafter through Jesus Christ our Lord. The scripture lesson is written in Isaiah chapter 59 beginning at verse 12. For our offenses are many in your sight, and our sins testify against us. Our offenses are ever with us, and we acknowledge our iniquities, rebellion, and treachery against the Lord, turning our backs on our God, inciting revolt and oppression, uttering lies our hearts have conceived. So justice is driven back, and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets, Honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found. And whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him. And his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. According to what they have done, so he will be pay wrath to his enemies and retribution to his foes. He will repay the islands their due. From the west, people will fear the name of the Lord, and from the rising of the sun, they will revere his glory. And he will come like a pent-up flood that the breath of the Lord drives along. The Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. All we like sheep have gone astray. 
and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We'll continue with the hymn Righteousness that's printed in the service bulletin and I believe on the screen as well. say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will purify us from all unrighteousness. Our text for this evening is written in Luke chapter 18, uh, beginning at verse 9. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Your fellow redeemed by the blood of Jesus, which he shed on the cross to pay for the sins of all people, and that means us. This is Ash Wednesday. The season of Lent begins today. Changes are made. Some congregations will not put flowers on their altar on Wednesdays during Lent as a sign of Lent. Some churches will 
uh, omit songs of joy on Sunday morning, such as, O Lord, our Lord, at the time of Lent. In the old days, you couldn't get married in a church during Lent without some special dispensation. For us, it's Wednesday evening services. It's dinners before the services. And when we come into church, we see the violet pyramids. There's a reason for this color. I'm no color expert, but those who seem to know what mood colors put people in, violet is said to be one for somber reflection. And so Lent traditionally has been a time for Christians to look at themselves, to consider their own hearts, a season to come before God in repentance. That's all well and good, and it's proper that we do that. But if our Lenten vision goes no further than our own hearts, it's all for nothing. If we're only using the stethoscope to look inside it, not the telescope to look to our Savior, Lent is meaningless. For Lent is not so much about what's in our hearts, but Lent is about what's in the heart of God. Lent is about what Jesus came and did for us because the love of God sent him to do this for us. And in all this, the bottom line is this. Lent means forgiveness. And in this parable, we see two aspects of this. It doesn't mean forgiveness for those who think they have something to give to God, but Lent means forgiveness for those who fear they have nothing to give to God. The verses before us are parable. Parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. This incident may well have taken place, or Jesus may have made it up to teach a lesson. The first person we meet in the parable is a Pharisee. The Pharisees were a kind of denomination or maybe a splinter group or sect among the Jews, a religious one. The very name Pharisee seems to mean separate, and in many ways the Pharisees separated themselves from the other Jews. They had their own kind of group that they associated with. One of the uh, most telling characteristics of the Pharisees was their promotion of law. In some respects, this was good. They pointed the people to the Old Testament law that God had given them, and they asked demanded, commanded them to follow that Old Testament law. Problem was, they didn't stop there. The Pharisees also thought up many laws on their own that weren't God's laws, and they tried to impose these on the people too. But the bottom line was, the Pharisees really tried hard to follow the laws. They were thought of very highly among the people. Today, Pharisee is kind of a term of contempt. You don't want to be called a Pharisee, but at the time of Jesus, the Pharisees were highly regarded, nearly saints in the eyes of the people. And that's sort of what we see in this Pharisee in our text. Outwardly, he looks like a pretty good guy. He comes to the temple, not to the actual temple itself or the Ark of the Covenant had been, but to the temple area. But he tried to get as close as he could to that temple where only the priests were allowed. And there he spoke to God. He said some things about himself. He said, I'm not a robber. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not someone like that tax collector back there. He was right. He was right to, in what he said about himself. I think if we could have him, we'd like to have this Pharisee as our neighbor, maybe even as our brother-in-law. He seems like he was devoted to doing what is right. He went over and above what God had commanded. God had commanded the Jews to fast one day a year on Yom Kippur. One day a year they had to fast. This guy fasted twice a week. 
God had commanded the Jews to give one-tenth of the increase of their flock and fields. He gave 10% of everything that came his way, whether it was a gift, an inheritance, or money he earned. Didn't have anything to do with his flock or field that he gave. He just gave. Outwardly. What a God. But then we look a little further. His outward life was righteous. His heart certainly wasn't. This man came before God expecting nothing from God. He did not have anything that he wanted God really to give him. He came before God just expecting God to be thankful for him. Expecting God to kind of pat him on the back. Expecting God to say, oh, I'm so fortunate to have you. He came before God convinced of his own righteousness and his own holiness without need for anything from God except maybe validation. And so he went home. He went home justified. The word justify means declared righteous. He went home justified not in the eyes of God. He went home justified in his own eyes. He went home thinking, I'm a pretty good person, and I'm, God is probably very glad he's got me. But one thing he did not go home with was forgiveness. There was a simple reason. He didn't think he needed it. He didn't think he had anything that God should forgive him for. He was righteous and holy in God's sight. If you told him that let means forgiveness, he would have said, well, then it's meaningless to me because I don't need it. One of the kind of standard things you see in, especially cartoons over the years, is the two characters on the shoulders of one of the uh, characters in the cartoon. On the one shoulder, there's an angel. And on the other shoulder, there's a devil. And they're competing. The angel is telling the character to do good, and the devil is telling the character to do just the opposite. It's kind of an interesting uh, way of presenting things, but not really very accurate spiritually. Be much more accurate spiritually if we substituted the angel and the devil for two other characters. One of the characters would be this tax collector. For as much as we have to criticize about him, the sad truth is we have a Pharisee living inside of us. Our sinful nature is pure Pharisee. Our sinful nature thinks it is right before God. Our sinful nature thinks it is righteous before God and has no need for forgiveness. And this plays out in several ways. Our sinful nature is very fond of reminding us that we're probably a bit better than most people. Probably a bit better than almost all people. Our sinful nature tells us it's other people's fault. It's other people's problem. We should be getting credit for what we do. This comes into play in different ways. Sometimes it's this time of year. Some people at this time of year give up something for Lent. And I can tell you that there have been years when uh, our family made changes during Lent just to kind of help us focus on what Lent was about. We didn't broadcast it. We didn't make it a hard and fast rule. But sometimes people give up something during Lent and then look down their nose at somebody else who didn't give it up. They give up something during Lent as a sacrifice to show their God that they are righteous before him rather than to remind themselves that they are not righteous before him. Sometimes this Pharisee that sits on our shoulder, that lives in our hearts, leads us to compare ourselves to others. And so maybe we do more than others. For example, at church, and the Pharisee on our shoulder says, 
those other people who aren't contributing, what's wrong with them? You're pretty good because you are contributing. It's good that people contribute, but it's wrong if it's a comparison. This Pharisee that sits on our shoulder invades our personal lives. It says, oh, dear God, look at all that I have put up with with my children or with my parents or with my spouse. Don't I deserve something from you? Don't I deserve some credit from you because of what I've had to go through? One thing that Pharisee on our shoulder doesn't want doesn't need is forgiveness. I've run into this several times, many times. I had a young man sit in my office once and say, Pastor, my big problem is I'm too good to other people. At a pastoral conference once, one of our pastors stood up and said, my problem is I'm too humble. On Facebook, I read over and over again people saying, oh, my life is so much better since I learned to love myself or since I learned to forgive myself as though myself were the most important thing and I deserve to be loved and I deserve to be forgiven. When the Pharisee takes over in our lives, it gives us something it gives us peace of mind. We sleep the sleep of the righteous because we're holy and righteous before God and there's nothing that is going to do against us. But it sleeps the sleep of death for the Pharisee in us that does not want forgiveness does not receive forgiveness and may go home justified in his own mind but not in the sight of God. That is most certainly what we do not want. That is most assuredly not how we want to close our eyes tonight. And that absolutely is not how we want to meet our God when he calls us out of this world. We do not want to be among those who say, God has nothing to give us. Lent means forgiveness. Not for those who think that God has nothing to give them but for those who know that they have nothing to give God. The second person in these verses was the tax collector. Tax collectors worked for the Roman government. The Roman, uh, Rome had conquered uh, the Israelites. They were subjects of Rome, and they instituted a system to collect taxes from those people, those taxes went to support the Roman army, which was occupying Israel. It would be sort of like if the country of Iran conquered the United States and taxed us so that we could feed and clothe and house the occupying army that was ruling over us. You can guess how these tax collectors were regarded, but there was another thing about tax collectors. It was a different system. The tax collectors had to send in a certain amount of taxes, so they had their quota that they had to fulfill. But they had no limit on what they could collect. And the tax collectors were notorious for collecting much more than what they needed to, and they became wealthy all on their own. They were such notorious sinners, or regarded as such, unpatriotic, thieving, friends of Rome, that they were automatically excommunicated. They couldn't even go to worship services in the synagogue. I'm sure when this Pharisee saw this tax collector there in the temple courtyard, he thought, what is that guy here? He does not belong anywhere near a house of worship. This tax collector was much different from the Pharisee. The Pharisee tried to get as close to the temple itself as he could. The tax collector stood far off. The Pharisee lifted his face to heaven. The tax collector bowed his face to earth. The Pharisee raised his hands in prayer. The tax collector smote his chest in sorrow. The tax collector had a much different prayer than the Pharisee. The Pharisee didn't really ask for anything in his prayer. All he did was talk about himself. The tax collector said, 
Lord, have mercy on me. Mercy is something that you looked for when your situation was so desperate that there was no way out. And in the case of the tax collector, as we'll hear in another minute, what he thought there was no way out from was his sins. The Pharisee said many things about himself. The tax collector said two words about himself. A sinner. He came before God with nothing. He came before God with what we call contrition. We're taught about the word contrition, that it means to be sorry for sin. And there is an important aspect of contrition that does mean sorrow over sin. And I would guess even the violet in our pyramids is meant to make us more somber or sad because of when we think about our sins. But a much more important aspect of contrition is terror is fear. To be contrite is to be crushed by God, driven down into despair, at loss as to what's going to happen next, to be reduced to pleading for mercy because everything is falling apart. And that's what the tax collector did. Now, he did not receive anything from God because he was contrite. He didn't receive anything from God because he was afraid. He didn't receive anything from God because he was sorry. He received forgiveness. But all that contrition did was show him that he had nothing, nothing in his heart or life to give God for which God should give anything to him. And in that emptiness, God poured the fullness of his forgiveness. Jesus tells us that this man went home justified, declared righteous, forgiven in the sight of God, not because of what he had done, but because of God's mercy. And that brings us back to those two cartoon characters again, doesn't it? We got that Pharisee sitting on one shoulder. That's self-generated. That's something that comes about because we've got a sinful nature. But we need another character on the other shoulder. I think that tax collector is a pretty good candidate. The tax collector stands for contrition. Contrition is not something that we manufacture. Being crushed is not something that we do to ourselves. Being made to be afraid because of our sins is not self-generated. Contrition is something that comes from God. God crushes our hearts. God makes us afraid. Contrition is never a pleasant experience. Contrition is always painful. <coughs> From contrition, it prepares us. It makes us afraid. It makes us afraid, first of all, of God's judgment. God's looked at my life. He's seen into my heart. He knows that I'm not the good, kind, generous, loving, patient, devout person that other people might say about me at my funeral. God has looked in my heart and seen and recognized all the thoughts and attitudes that are there. And when we're contrite, we're saying, oh no, I'm going to be found guilty. Contrition makes us afraid. Not just of God's judgment, but of God's punishment. What's God going to do to me now? I've been found guilty. I don't deserve anything from him. I've got nothing to give to him. What's he going to do to me? And in this terror, God comes to us and gives us forgiveness. Lent means forgiveness. Forgiveness that is ours by God's grace. God's grace is his love for us in Christ, even though we deserve the opposite. Lent means forgiveness in, through Jesus, through his work. And it's very proper that at this time of year, in Lent, we focus on the work, the suffering and death of Jesus for our sins. Lent means forgiveness through the gospel. We have extra church services now. This is great. Because 
these church services that we hear this good news, this good news that God has forgiven us in Christ. I don't think Lent makes much of an impact on the people of our world anymore, not as much as it did a generation or two ago. Today I ate lunch at Big Red. They had a Lent menu, specials on fish. I'm guessing for many people that's about the extent of what Lent means to them, something like that. But for us, that is not going to be. For us, Lent is going to mean the most significant thing that we could ever ask for. Lent means forgiveness. We're not going to be the Pharisee who comes to God with nothing to, with everything to give and expecting God to justify us, declare us righteous. We're going to come as a tax collector with hearts empty because they've been crushed by God's law ready to be filled with the perfect righteousness and forgiveness that is ours in Jesus. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We will continue with our meditation response, hymn 303, with broken heart and contrite sigh.
give thee but thine own, whate'er the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone. A trust, O Lord, from thee. Amen. Let us rise for prayer. Holy and righteous God, we begin again the solemn spiritual journey of Lent. We come before you in deep humility. We confess that we are sinners both by the nature we inherit and by the sinful thoughts and desires, words and actions that nature produces. Because of our sins, we deserve only your wrath and punishment. Yet you reveal yourself not as a God of holiness and justice, but as a God of mercy and love, despairing of our own merits and worthiness, and in response to your gracious invitation, we come pleading for your forgiveness. Lord, have mercy on us for your holy name's sake. Lord, have mercy on us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil, who overcame us by a tree, would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. <laughs>
We now invite and encourage all those confirmed members of our congregation here at St. Paul's or our sister congregations of the Wisconsin Synod to follow the direction of our ushers and receive God's grace and forgiveness through Jesus' body and blood. And certainly, without uh, judging anyone's faith, uh, we, we humbly ask our guests and visitors to kindly wait until we have an opportunity to talk about this, this doctrine of the Lord's Supper. Come now, for all things are ready. Now may this strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Depart knowing that God is at peace with you. Amen. Please stand. you have refreshed us with this holy supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his shine on you and be gracious to you. Lord, look on you with favor and give you peace. Please remain standing for our closing hymn, 319, On My Heart and Print Your Image. 